Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Online Virtual Museum. Uh, today, we're joined by Sherry Stout from Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Uh, thank you for joining us, Sherry. I'm glad to be here. She'll be doing a presentation on some historic mining photography that was taken in Pennsylvania. Um, it was actually commissioned by the Smithsonian, and she'll go into a little bit of the history about that. Um, if you guys are interested, there's also some other programming coming up uh, later on this week. You can check out nmih.org for more information on some of our other programs that are coming up. And we're adding new stuff all the time, so please check back uh, either on our Facebook page here or on our website. Um, there's also a couple ways that you can help out the museum while we're shut down right now. You can either buy a membership, uh, which will last you uh, from a year from the date that we reopen. Um, if you're using Amazon to, you know, get your uh, toilet paper or Lysol wipes delivered, uh, you can use Amazon Smile and that'll um, donate a portion of your sales to the museum. Um, we have eBooks, you can shop our gift shop, adopt artifacts. There's a couple different ways that you can help support the National Museum of Industrial History uh, while we're shut down. Um, so we appreciate any help that you can give right now. And again, you can check out the programs uh, and ways you can help us out at nmih.org. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to Sherry here and I hope you guys enjoy the presentation. Thanks, Sherry. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am delighted to join the Virtual National Museum of Industrial History and I'm happy to be part of one of their speaking programs. I'm Sherry Stout. I'm a collections manager at the National Museum of American History in Washington, DC. I am at my home, like uh, most people these days. I'm outside uh, Washington this morning. Um, what I do when I'm working at the museum, I care for the collections at our offsite storage facilities, um, which includes pretty much everything in the collections. But over the course of my career, I've worked very closely with objects like trains, cars, clocks, phonographs, um, things in the food technology collections, whaling, and of course the mining collection. I take care of collections and storage, but I have also worked on preparing and installing exhibitions. When I started at the museum, I didn't know anything about mining um, and the objects in that collection. I'm from Virginia and I'm descended from farmers and blue collar workers and my dad was a UPS man. But I've gradually learned about mining and things like mining lamps because we have a deep collection of mining artifacts, mainly from the anthracite coal region in Pennsylvania and it goes back to the 1880s. The collection contains mining lamps, hats, company script, surveying equipment, clothing, and archival material. The reason we have some of that collection has to do with the story I'm here to tell you today. There's a show on television called Secrets of the Museum or Museum Secrets, and every so often I find myself watching that program, and sometimes they squeeze something into those 30 minutes that I'm not really sure is a secret. It's more just a good story. But Secrets of the Museum sounds good, doesn't it? And I hope when I'm done today that you'll have a little bit of that. I'm not revealing a secret, but I do have a good story to tell. And it all took place near Bethlehem and in around Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Without the coal miners and their ingenuity and the ingenuity of the people from the coal region, along with the ingenuity of the people from the Smithsonian, we wouldn't have a story. And there's quite a few strands to the story. So just sit back, let me weave it together, and maybe that'll distract you from uh, what's going on all around us right now. In the late 19th century, there were a series of world's fairs. The big one was in Philadelphia in 1876 for the centennial. In fact, at NMIH, there are objects from the 1876 World's Fair, including a fabulous display of metal files on red fabric, which is one of my favorite objects. So when the museum reopens, maybe you can take a look at those. The Smithsonian would both put on big displays of artifacts at these fairs, but we would also collect from them. Often we'd take away railway cars full of artifacts from the fairs. For our story today, we're looking at the New Orleans Fair in 1884. Its official title was World's Industrial Cotton Centennial Exposition, and the theme was celebrating the 100th anniversary of the earliest shipment of cotton to Europe. All of these expeditions were fantastic affairs with enormous buildings that were always the biggest built at the time and fantastic feats of engineering. All of the industries in America sent the best and brightest with their newest inventions and technology. The Liberty Bell was even shipped to New Orleans and displayed there. Unfortunately, 
1884 Expo was notorious for the fact that the gentleman who organized it embezzled $1.7 million from it and skipped the country afterwards. But that's another story. For our purposes, the fair itself was quite successful, visited by huge numbers of people. And as usual, the Smithsonian prepared a very large display, which included an exhibit on coal mining. The curators wanted people to know how things worked, where things came from, and especially regionalized things like coal. Everyone used coal and needed coal, but very few people knew the science of it, or more importantly, how it was mined, where it came from, and how it got into everyone's homes. Enter the U.S. National Museum. At the same time that the Smithsonian was preparing exhibits for these big exhibitions, they were building their first new museum on the National Mall, and preparing exhibits for the new museum building. This is the U.S. National Museum, and today we refer to this building as the is next door to the castle, the original Smithsonian building. Here's a photo of the castle and the National Mall in 1865 at the end of the Civil War and in the very early days of the Smithsonian. By the 1880s, the Smithsonian was expanding and needed a new building. It was referred to as the U.S. National Museum under the guidance of our second secretary, Spencer Baird, who came from Reading, Pennsylvania. The museum was employing people like Frederick P. Dewey, curator of mining and metallurgy to install exhibits in the new building. And here, this is a slide of an individual that we are pretty sure is Frederick Dewey working and performing experiments either in the castle or the A&I building. It's Dewey who wants to represent all aspects of mining. He wants to collect objects like miners tools and clothes but he also wants pictures taken of everything so that they can be installed in New Orleans and the Smithsonian's mining display to depict, American for the, um, to depict mining for the American public. He sends a man who works for him to Pennsylvania. His name was John Templeman Brown. Brown enlists the talents of Pottsville photographer George Bretz. By the time they're doing this, it's already the end of the summer in 1884, and they must have been under the gun to get the photos done get them back to the Smithsonian, and then install them in the displays in New Orleans. I always think that moves, things moved slower in the 19th century, but in reading about this, I'm not so sure. You now need to know a little about George Bretz, if you haven't heard of him already. George Bretz opened his photo studio in Pottsville in 1870, across the street from another photographer. Bretz expert Tom Beck, thought that both studios succeeded because they worked together, which is probably something we could all take a lesson on. Apparently, Bretz had artistic talents, making drawings and possibly busts. He photographed local politicians, made stereo views with his neighbor, and gained fame from photographing the Molly Maguires before they were hanged. He sold those photos as carte de visites. What else was the Smithsonian doing here? As I mentioned, the Smithsonian, specifically curator Dewey, wanted to collect the picture of what working in a mine was like. He did this for all types of mining, and he sent Templeman Brown here to collect on anthracite mining. He sent museum staff or agents across America and published an anthology in 1891, which includes Bretz's photos in the section discussing anthracite coal. They collected items they could put in the museum, such as lamps and clothing, but then they wanted to photograph the aspects that they couldn't actually collect or take from. And this is where the photography comes in. It appears that Dewey thought that it was possible to photograph inside the mine and expected Templeman Brown to just do it. And Brown's letters indicate that he was frustrated and wondered how he would photograph the interior of a mine from which the rays of the sun were, quote, alien. They chose the Kohenor mine. Sorry, there's a photo of the Molly Maguires. And here, uh, Maguires. And here's the Kohenor colliery. They chose this Kohenor mine at Shenandoah because it was the thickest seam of coal known at the time. This mine had penetrated the mammoth coal seam. A particular portion of the mine was chosen in which a thickness of 42 and a half feet of coal was exposed and part of the roof had recently been blasted away, along with some of the supporting pillars of coal. A process referred to as robbing the mine. 
This area was 500 feet below the surface. So let's talk a little bit about the history of, the under, of underground photography. Apparently by this time in 1884, some underground photography had been accomplished both in Europe and in America by using magnesium wire. A photograph had been taken in Mammoth Cave in Kentucky using that particular method. So they attempted to light the mine at Kohinoor using magnesium wire, but it failed. I'm guessing it was just too black, but the reasons are not outlined anywhere that I can find. The management of the mine, Philadelphia and Redding Coal and Iron Company, and of course the Smithsonian were very keen for this to succeed, so they pursued finding a way to electrically light the mine. So the Arno Electric Light Company supplied the electric equipment and ran the operation. And now this would be the first time anyone would use electricity to achieve underground photography. So how did they do it? There were five lights, each generating 2,000 candle power. Ten reflectors were, replaced, were placed behind the lights. Originally, they were going to put the dynamo, which is what this is a photo of. This is the unit to generate the electricity at the air compressor pumps, which would have been above ground. But the wire was too short, so they had to take it the 500 feet underground. It took six hours to put it in the rail car, get it in the mine, and set it up. It used a compressed air engine with two flywheels, and you can see the flywheels in this photo, and required 4,000 feet of wire to complete the electrical circuit. Late in the day on August 28, 1884, the dynamo was started. Now, I quote here from a paper that Dewey wrote um, describing the entire experience. For the first time could be seen at one glance its whole 42 and one half feet of alternating layers of coal, bony and slate, which could readily be distinguished by the pile of coal that had been blasted from the roof, containing many lumps of several tons weight, and it was an interesting sight. All the miners within sight quickly gathered to see this most unusual spectacle, and as the news of the brilliant illumination spread through the mine, a large number left their work and came to swell the crowd. Many old miners were attracted to the spot and were, if possible, more surprised and interested in the site than the strangers present, although most of them had spent the greater part of their lives in coal mine, but they had never before seen more than a few square feet of the coal at any one time. He goes on to write, the scene had its dark side since the bright light clearly revealed the great dangers from the fall of coal and slate to which the miners are constantly exposed. The bonds which held large masses, often of many tons weight to the roof and sides, were clearly seen to be very slender and frail and looked as if they might give way at any time. This clear revelation of dangers, before only dimly appreciated, must have an important bearing upon the question of the introduction of electric light into coal mines for practical mining purposes. Dewey also mentions the smoke and dust in the atmosphere, but of course there is no mention of health and safety. He merely mentions the effect this has on the attempt to take the photographic negative. So let's take a look at this before we move on. Lights have just been turned on in a space where the ceiling is being blasted away and workers have only seen their workspace with a teapot lamp, which is just a flame with a tiny bit of, you know, fuel inside. One of the things I like about this photo is that the guys running the dynamo are also using teapot lamps. So I can't get a sense of where the dynamo is in relation to the lighting they're using for the photo. Um, and where it is in relation to where Bretz is taking the picture. But if you think about nothing else, imagine not really ever seeing where you work fully because it's too dark. And then when someone does turn the lights on, they wonder if it's a really good idea because you might wonder if it's dangerous to work in there. This photo required a 10 minute exposure requiring the miners to hold that position without moving for 10 whole minutes. Dewey reports in his paper that they used three lights and that the big pile of coal is from the blasts made in robbing the mine. Dewey liked to point out the strata of the coal. Today I like this photo because it's a wonderful photo of the miners' clothes and their tools. <clears throat> we have wonderful photos in our collections, but often we don't know the specifics of where or when they were taken. 
The only thing that would make this better, and I wish we knew this, is the names of the miners and their stories. How old are they? Were they immigrants? How long had they worked in the mines, etc.? This exposure also took 10 minutes. Dewey describes the miners using a pick. The next one is shoveling lumps for the mine car, and the third is drilling a blast hole. His blasting tools are clearly visible in the picture. Again, they are anonymous, but it is a time capsule, and between Bretts and Templeman Brown, they were getting the representative mining activities. I wonder if the miners were consulted on the composition of the photos or what should be represented. In this photo, the miner is using, quote, a modern patent drill, and the safety lamp is noted in Dewey's paper and prominently shown in the photo. This was a 15-minute exposure. Again, the variety of tools are represented. The Smithsonian was cognizant of showing all the latest tools and techniques in its exhibits. This photo shows the entrance to the, this area of the mine. It shows the rail tracks and some of the still extant coal pillars and support timbers. This photo required a 30-minute exposure. An improvised dark room was created inside the mine using a rail car, and Bretts had to come up with innovative photography techniques to develop the plates. Bretts appeared to have one set of plates for himself and one set for the Smithsonian, as there are two sets of negative numbers on the photos from Shenandoah Colliery. And when you compare the images in the Smithsonian collection and those of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, some of the poses are slightly different. Here is an example of that in this photo card of one of the underground photos with both the Arno Electric Company and Bretz's information at the bottom. The extra set would have been a way for Bretz to make money and to advertise. Before we leave the underground photos completely, let me show you this image from Indian Ridge Colliery in Eastern Pennsylvania. In Dewey's paper, he says that it was decided to move the dynamo to this colliery and attempt some photography there. As this coal mine was whitewashed on the interior and it was owned by the same company, everyone thought that the whitewash make, might make for good photos. According to Dewey's account, they used seven lights there and Brett's made a single negative exposure for one and a half hours. Dewey said that Bretz made, um, that, uh, that Bretz reported that the negative was defective and the lights were left on so that visitors could come and see the mine, but that no useful photograph was produced. Dewey says in his paper that broad rays of light fell upon the negative. That does in indeed seem to be the case. So it appears that the Smithsonian did not take this plate, but Bretz did keep the image and copies of it have survived. In addition to the photographs taken underground, Brett's photographed work life above ground at the colliery, and these were purchased by the Smithsonian. And again, it appears that Brett's kept a second copy for himself. Here are some of my favorites. This is Breaker Boys. Here's the mine entrance. Here are mules with the cars. Here's management, bosses talking, and note the difference in the clothing. Your workers in the car. I think that's probably one of my favorites. So what happened next? The underground photos were indeed sent to the exhibit in New Orleans. Not only that, they were enlarged to the side of, size of 30 inches by 40 inches. They were such a success that I believe that after New Orleans, the enlargements were displayed in the U.S. National Museum for a time. Based on what Dewey says in his paper he read in 1887 and published in 1888, it appears that John Templeman Brown passed away sometime between 1885 and 1887. Frederick P. Dewey went on to research and publish his illustrated catalog of the mining and mineral collections at the U.S. National Museum. But by the time it was published in 1891, he was no longer employed by the Smithsonian. And by the 1910s, the museum was led by curators interested in technology represented more by models than by specimens, and some of the collections Dewey brought in were discarded. Happily, many of his mineral collections are now at the Natural History Museum, and to my delight, we uncovered the original glass print negatives of the underground photo shoot in cold storage, along with many file prints. A few of the objects he, collection, he collected also remain in the collection, including these mining lamps. The copper lamp is especially wonderful. That's one of my favorite objects. George Bretz was a prolific photographer, photographing the people of the region, producing portraits and landscapes that captured the history and flavor of the anthracite region. 
In my opinion, the photo and the collection that um, this photo in the collection of UMBC epitomizes his skill. This photograph of a miner's funeral with the empty casket because the body could not be recovered from an accident that took his life is especially captivating. Even the horses are looking at the camera. It captures the entire community, the landscape, and the occupation that consumes them all with the white empty casket at the center. Tragically, Bretz's studio burned in 1892 when the neighboring millinery shop caught fire. He was underinsured and preparing for a display for the Chicago 1893 World's Fair. Apparently what was in his wagon survived and what he was working on for the fair was okay. But the bulk of his plates and early work was lost, making the glass plates at the, Sme at the Smithsonian unique survivors. We do have this um, printing block for, from his, um, his shop. Here's a photo of the building at the World's Columbian Exposition, built exclusively for the display of the mine and mining materials. It must have been spectacular. And from what we know, Brett's had photos inside this building. Here, there is some indication he may even have remounted the underground photos in the display in 1893. Bretz died in 1895 at the age of 53, just a few years after the fire. There's a collection of Bretz's material online at the UMBC site, and a book published about him and, a full, and full of his photos is um, a blog I did some years ago about the underground photos has since been picked up by other websites in this area, and the Smithsonian's photos are all available online. Years after Dewey and Bretz were gone, a new curator came to the museum, and his name was John Hoffman. He was from the Anthracite area and envisioned a coal hall at the National Museum of American History. He revived the museum's collection of anthracite objects, including the Bretz photos, but that is a story for another day. Back to you, Glenn. Here are some of our um, online resources too, and um, you all can uh, click on these links once this is uh, posted onto the, the NCH website. Sorry, Sherry, didn't realize I was muted. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us uh, for this presentation. I was just looking at our uh, Facebook comments. I don't think we have any, uh, any questions so far, so um, I think we're good. Thanks again for joining us, and uh, thanks everybody out there that uh, came to the presentation or is watching it afterwards. Uh, again, if you're looking for more programming, you can check out our Facebook page um, or our website at nmih.org and just click on the uh, virtual museum link there. Um, and also there's a couple of different ways that you can help support the National Museum of Industrial History uh, while we're currently closed. Um, whether it's buying a museum membership, adopting artifacts, or using Amazon Smile to help donate to the museum. Um, hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day and have a great afternoon. Thanks again, Sherry. Thank you. Everybody have a great day.